Quinn Axe. My name is Martin Delahunty and I'm in an independent publishing consultant. I will be your moderator for today's webinar, which is in support of this year's International Open Access Week and is hosted by World Scientific Publishing. World Scientific Publishing is participating with the global open access community to coordinate in taking action to make openness the default for research and to ensure that equity is at the center of this work. Open science and open access publishing can be best defined as the practice of freely sharing clinical and scientific knowledge such that others can collaborate and build upon that knowledge to accelerate research applications. And consistently during the COVID-19 global pandemic, open access publishing has contributed to the rapid translation of scientific knowledge into the successful treatments and public health strategies. Open access in Asia has it also advanced significantly with many stakeholders now constructing policies and practices to support its adoption and implementation. Whilst concerns remain about inequities in global information, the global information system and wide access to its benefits, there is much good news to share from the Asia region. So the purpose of this webinar is to present a range of open access stakeholders perspectives, including research funder, librarian, research institute and academic publisher. We have five excellent panelists with whom we will engage in a lively discussion. We, all, we will also welcome questions from the audience which we'll cover at the end of this webinar. I will now hand over to Dr. Chi Wai Li, General Manager, World Scientific Publishing, to introduce himself and explain briefly about World Scientific's commitment to open access. Dr. Li. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, this is Rick Lee from World Scientific. I've been with the con company for over 25 years. So I'm very happy to have everyone join me to this uh, webinar to talk about the open access in Asia. But first of all, I want to introduce World Scientific and our open access journey. Established in 1981 to promote science in the developing world, World Scientific is one of the largest independent publishers in the world. And it is the largest international scientific publisher in the Asia Pacific region. Currently, we publish around 600 book titles a year in both print and digital formats in most academic subject areas. Our books are, have also been translated to over 30 languages. Well Scientific publishes over 140 peer-reviewed journals, with over 20 of them are fully open access journals, while the rest are all hybrid journals. We have been engaged in open access publishing for both books and journals for over 10 years, with the very first immediate open access article published in one of our journals in 2009. This summer, on May 2021, Well Scientific became one of the very first international publishers to part in the Scope 3 Sponsoring Consortium for Open Access Publishing in Particle Physics for their books initiative to transition key textbooks and monographs in particle physics and related fields to open access. We are now working with Scoop 3 on the second phase of this program to select many more titles to transition to open access. Well Scientific also committed to support open access publishing in developing and transition economy countries around the world. We have partnered with ELFO, Electronic Information for Libraries, a not-for-profit organization, to enable researchers from these emerging countries to publish open access in World Scientific journals with heavily discounted or even full waiver of the article processing charge. As an international publisher, World Scientific is committed to open access publishing. And we believe it is going to be the dominating mode of academic publishing in the coming years. While open access has gained acceptance and is evolving rapidly in Europe and North America, the acceptance and supporting levels in Asian region varies. Through today's webinar, by talking to our panel of experts, we will try to look into open access in the region in more detail. We hope 
after this discussion, we have a deeper understanding of the open access situation in Asia and be able to find our way to move forward more rapidly. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And I would now like to welcome and introduce our esteemed guest panelists. Um, I will briefly introduce each, and then I will ask each just to describe briefly your role. And there, thereafter, we will engage in some discussions. So if I could begin with uh, Professor Prasit Palita Pongarnpim, who is Executive Vice President for Na the National Science and Technology Development Agency of Thailand. Professor Prasad, could you briefly explain your role, please? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm working in the National Science and Technology Development Agency, which is basically a major research institute in Thailand, which holds a number of national technology centers. Uh, previously, we also work as a funding agency, but uh, from this year, we will start to move a little bit to, to the work of managing, say, some national programs, not, not a general funder, but many some national programs, particularly on the one that is uh, interaction between science and economy and society. So, in general, we tend to have to work with multidisciplinary researchers our complex sectorial partners and work with medical institutes and in various countries. Uh, as a part of global scientific community, we are considering the open science principle as uh, one of the guidelines always work. So open access publication is fully acceptable and, and, and actually a little bit encouraged in 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 NASA, but we more encouraged in terms of recommendation to 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 see the standard journals rather than that open access. Basically, we, we are more more concerned about the standard journals than than open access. Uh, but as you may imagine, the the. One of the major obstacles, uh, maybe the COVID, COVID pandemic show us the benefit of open science policy. But one of the major obstacles that happened during COVID is a budget cut. And also <laughs> make the publication in open access much more difficult. Uh, each year we spend more than 500,000 US dollars in, in open access application fee. And it actually our number is increasing every year. So I just just would like to share share you uh, this information at at this, at this day. Thank you very much, Dr. Professor Prasad. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, we will come back to questions, particularly around funding. Uh, our next guest is uh, Professor Lu Longbo, who's the assistant director of the Faculty of Anesthesiology at Shanghai Hospital. Uh, Naval Medical University in China, and Professor Bo is also an executive deputy editor-in-chief of the Journal of Emergency Management and Disaster Communications. Uh, Professor Bo, could you just briefly explain your, your role? Okay, uh, it's my honor to attend this uh, meeting online to, to be the role uh, playing the Open Access Week. Uh, currently, I'm working in Shanghai at a territory academic Medical Center, you can see uh, I'm wearing my surgical clothing because I have several surgeries and the anesthesia need to be done in the next few hours. And it, it's my honor and uh, the joy of me is to, to, to be to introduce the journal, the Emergency Management and Disaster Communication uh, to, to the audience here and to all of the users online access journals, which is funded uh, last year. So that, that is a brief uh, introduction on myself and our journal. Thanks. Thanks, Marty. Professor Bo, thank you. We'll come back to some more questions. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Adi Naran Anan. Uh, I hope I pronounced that name right correctly, who is a university librarian. 
Got it. Got it. At uh, Valor Institute of Technology in India. Welcome, uh, Dr. Anana. So yeah. please could you explain a little bit about your role? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. As far as the Asian countries in the early 1990s, it was famous for the open access initiative by publishers and other uh, academic institutions and research institutions. But the thing is, the policy makers and decision makers who are involved in the government side, they have to come forward, take a decision to encourage the research scholars and teachers community to publish in the open access forum. As far as the India, the government of India started one platform called National Digital Library. In the National Digital Library is a single platform, One India Digital India Movement. So in this platform, our government of India's mode is to publish all the teachers' content, repository of articles, lecture notes, everything. So all the publishers, including World Scientific, to come forward to participate the government of India plan called National Digital Library of India. This is my humble request. World Scientific may come forward as a first publisher to discuss about the articles published in this platform. So all the scholars, teachers, and research communities will get benefit directly. That is my view, personal view. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And we'll we'll certainly come back to ask more questions about the uh, the digital library and the platform. That that sounds very, very interesting. So we'd like you to share more later. If I, if I can move on to Professor Jean Jun Lo, who's uh, Executive Director at the Institute of Materials Research and Engineering, uh, a, a star in Singapore. And Professor Lo is also an editor in chief for the World Scientific Annual Review of Functional Materials. Professor Lo, welcome. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I am Sien Jun from the Institute of Materials Research and Engineering. That's my day job where I oversee an institute of about 450 people, scientists, uh, as well as the technical staff. And we primarily specialize in uh, science use inspired basic research. Publishing is something that we encounter on a very frequent basis, day-to-day -day basis. And um, we have observed how the publishing landscape has changed over the years. And this time around, with an increasing focus uh, on open access. And um, in, in, this, in this respect, I think that uh, open access publishing has allowed us to actually disseminate a lot of our work uh, more to the public uh, and to our collaborators as well. Um, my other role now is a new role as the Editor-in-Chief of the Annual Reviews um, of Functional Materials. And this is something where I think um, I have undertaken together uh, with the blessings of World Scientific to try to come up with a, a volume of collections which is actually useful to practitioners in the field and will be something that people will look forward to referring to for many years to come. Um, that's in short, that's a little bit about me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jian Jun. Thank you very much. And we will we'll certainly come back to talk, talk more and always good to have a, a, a focus from Singapore, very close to, to World Scientific. So if I could uh, begin with some questions and uh, if I can come back to uh, Professor Prasit, uh, I think it would be very interesting to learn a little bit more from uh, Thailand and, the, and the, the Thai government's perspective on the benefits of open access. So from the funding agency's perspective and from the government's perspective, um, Professor Prasad, what, what, what do you see as the benefits of open access? Uh, a public can keep a personal view. <laughs> I, I, I think that the, the perspective of funding agency is still not, not consensus and the government have still not 
very well aware of the open science policy. Uh, but I think the open science policy and open access is probably the future. And in that sense, we think of it as a, as a method to, to increase the quality and integrity of our research. It, it, uh, that is a primary purpose. That is a primary purpose. Uh, if everything is quite open, then it's easier to see to to, to make it say reproducible and and other kind of quality assurance. Uh, it's also important in terms of accessibility because our work uh, multidisciplinary, and actually we have collaboration in ASEAN quite a bit, and. Uh, for example, uh, we are involving a lot in, in project of genomics Thailand, which work on genomics. But when you work on genomics, from time to time, you may need to consult literature on, say, anthropology, <laughs> which obviously we will not access to any literature on anthropology in, in NASDAQ. Uh, but we have access to through some open journal of of, of anthropology, uh, uh, that kind of thing. So accessibility is, is quite important if we have multiple people for multiple disciplines working together so that they are more familiar with the literature of, of their colleagues. And of course, and finally, we, we are also hoping open access will increase the, the citations or, 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 or the visibility of our research as well. But the primary purpose would be, would be the, the quality and integrity of research. Thank you. And Thank that's you. A, gr a great point to make about the quality uh, associated with open access, because unfortunately, there's still some misperceptions about uh, open access being associated with lower quality, which, which, which is not the case. But, uh, Professor Bo, maybe uh, I could ask you about uh, your experience with uh, a journal and your your busy clinician. But what do you see is the uh, uh, the benefit of your journal being open access? Uh, well, I think that open access could be a very good option for all of the researchers, uh, whether they're a, a clinician, a doctor, or from other specialties to access the latest uh, uh, publications from the journals in time. So uh, because I had published uh, several articles and the uh, reviews, then maybe 50% of my publications are in open access. Uh, because mm -hmm. as, as we know that uh, uh, several publishing groups or has raised a lot of journals to be open access options. And that is a very good option for researchers from, the, from China or from the uh, developing countries to distribute their knowledge to the uh, academic uh, community. But as to our journal, which is the GMBC, uh, Journal of the Emergency Management and Disaster Communications, and this is a journal that is that was founded last year, as I said before, and uh, we had uh, issued the first issue on COVID-19 in 2000 uh, in November, and uh, I think that it benefits from the open access that was uh, published from the uh, World Scientific Group uh, publishing group and has uh, distributed, distributed, distributed our knowledge on the COVID-19 from China, the knowledge very quickly. Uh, currently, our journal addresses issues of the disaster medicine and education, uh, disaster reporting, prevention, examination, mm -hmm. rescue, and other aspects of research. So uh, the, our journal covers the following six columns such as strategies, policy and management, news information and the communications, new media context and publish public emotion and behavior, and the effects of the protocol implications, history, culture, and beyond. Uh, uh, 
to, to be concluded, I think that's the good option, at least from the, for the developing countries. And I think the open science should play a more important role in the future to ensure the equity and uh, equity among researchers from all of the countries, whether they are from the developing or developed countries. Because as you know that some of our submissions are from uh, uh, Pakistan, Africa countries, and also from the, the North American such as USC and uh, Canada. So I think this, I think it's open access that helps our journal to group. That's my uh, little experiences. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Professor Bo. That that's great to share. And uh, and maybe if I come to the the, the librarian's uh, perspective, Doctor Adi Naran, yeah. uh, what 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 are the challenges for open access in in India, and particularly for your university? The challenges means that everything under the in government side because the policy is made by government and private institutions once they have to change the policy the open access movement will go very high impact because the peer review journals published only in uh, uh, leading publishers like Springer, Elsevier, all other publishers will get promotion or whatever it may be, the academic improvements. At the same time, if anyone is publishing in the open access platform, the recognition is less, less comparatively. So I hereby suggest the world scientific publishers to come forward to introduce a new concept called Institute Membership under Open Access category. So, each institute, either academic or research institute, scientific innovation output or research article may tie up with published only the open access of world scientific or whoever it may be, the MOU signed by the each institute. So automatically the scientific output will come in the open access platform. And also we have to give the representation to give the government to change the policy for other norms, that's all. And also I am suggesting to uh, publish the uh, uh, open access facility in National Digital Library, Government of India. The uh, National Strategic Planning Officer is the contact person. If you approach directly, the world scientific articles may publish in National Digital Library of India in single platform of our research scholars community. That's all. Thank you for sharing that. And there, there is a movement generally for governments and funders to create yes. unified digital platforms. So for example, the European Commission is creating a new unified digital platform where it's encouraging researchers to I guess, break from traditional journals and yes. publish first in the platform. Yeah. So the, the problem is not just distinct to India or Asia, it's, it's a general problem, but uh, there is progress being made. But thank you for sharing that. And uh, Professor Jean Jun, uh, from ASTAR perspe perspective, um, there is this, this uh, misperception that open access is still associated with lower quality and lower impact. How, how do we get over that hurdle? I think that most of the time, yes, uh, there are some people who think that uh, open access is actually something that is paid to publish. In fact, I think that the communication about the rigor and reliability of the review process is actually very important. I know that there are many um, esteemed and, and good publishers, of course, uh, World Scientific is one of them, that have open access journals and also very rigorous uh, review process. Open access has to be differentiated uh, uh, from predatory journals. So the, the low quality types of um, papers that in the past right, used to 
used to come from all these predatory journals are actually the ones that in the early days had sort of tarnished the reputation of open access. But now, you know, as, as we move on into a model whereby we're trying to get open access into something which is available for the public, uh, available uh, to practitioners to apply the findings, um, I think that we need to make the uh, review process very clear. And of course, in journals, there's always a need to bring in um, the recognized names as your board members, your advisory boards, your editorial boards. These will sort of give the, um, uh, the publishers, the, the people, the scholars who want to publish in the journal, a sort of confidence uh, that this is a journal which is serious in in, in reviewing the science and also publishing the science. Over. Thank you. That, that's that's great to share, and and that maybe leads on to a, a question for Dr. Lee from the publisher's side. So taking this into perspective, what more can publish in publishers in the Asia region be doing to support academics, funders, and librarians and researchers uh, with open access? I think uh, what uh, Sinjun mentioned is very true. At the beginning, I think open access, uh, the impression for the general on open access was not as positive. But over the years, actually, this so-called predatory publisher are getting less and less and all, almost all gone because people will be able to identify them quite easily now these days. And in our case, actually, the, the whole editorial process that make no difference whether this is an open access or non-open access. That means they all have to go through the same rigorous peer review and editorial process and totally no difference. The only difference is for the user, how they assess the content. So as a publisher, I think in, in Asia, um, we, we need to promote this type of uh, understanding because I think um, there are still a lot of misconception on open access being as, as, as long as you have the money, you can publish, which is not true at all. And, and as I mentioned previously, in, in, the, in the Western world, um, the global North, especially the Europe and uh, America, um, open access have no much of an issue on quality per se. But in Asia, the perception is still there. So that's why I said that the reason we have a, a, meet, a, a webinar like this and then we try to promote more open access in the region is to make people understand. But at the same time, we also have to take into consideration because of the, 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 the living standard and the amount of money that involve in open access. And that's one of the reasons why we take part in some of the international uh, uh, bodies to try to lower the price or the cost of open access and to support them. I mean, from our point of view, diversity and inclusion is very important. That means we have to include all other people who have the opportunities to, to publish. And, and also we want to be uh, diversified, not, not only a certain type of people can publish. So I think um, we, are, we are working along that line and this is our motto of how to move forward. Um, but at the same time, I think education is important. That means hopefully we have more and more this kind of uh, dialogue, discussion, uh, especially in uh, an Asian region, so that we have more understanding and, and move forward. Because actually the open access movement is moving very, very fast. I mean, the, the business model five years ago and now is totally different. And we have to catch up. And as an Asian country, as an Asian, I mean, headquarter in Asia, uh, international publisher, this is our role to, to make sure this is happening. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And uh, uh, maybe com coming back to uh, Professor Prasad, we were uh, talking a little bit there about the, the access to funding for open access. And as a, as, a, as a research funder, how sustainable is open access as a funding model for, for Thailand? Uh, honestly speaking, <laughs> I think at the at the current model is probably not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I mean, meaning that uh, only 
the proportion of a publication would be able to, to publish in open access. Uh, Why the majority may still need to publish, let's say, in a free model somehow. Uh, we are also a little bit worried about that uh, and, and, and think of a few ways with, with how we can solve it, but, but we do not really have a good answer yet. And how, how do you think publishers can support on that particular issue? Um, I mean, the, the showing the, the, the benefits of open access would certainly make the, the funders and the government to support more on the open access model. And of, of, of course, of course the, the, the price of open access publications sometimes is really, really high. Very high, which sometimes less the question whether it really need to be that high. Uh, so, so that that's something the publisher need to consider. But but if we are not going to talk about that, I I think we need to increase the value of the open access. I have I have a, a couple of suggestions uh, for for your consideration. The first one is that uh, the open access should the open access publishing should be a part of open science principles, meaning that open access publish, publishing should support the open data. Uh, I, I found, actually, personally, I found some open access do not actually request the data, the, the critical data from the, from the researcher, which means that I, I need to spend a lot more effort to, to get to that kind of data. Uh, instead of the fact that it should be easier if it is, say, give it, some location should be given immediately in, in the publication. The second point is that I think because open access would be accessible to all scientists, it may be a, a good practice, uh, which is done by some journal, is that you have a short paragraph explaining the research to a scientist, not a, an expert in that particular field. Just the people who are able to understand science, but, but, but enough to understand what, what, what you are talking about. <laughs> that kind of thing would be, would be really useful, I guess. Thank you. And uh, that's two, two excellent recommendations there. And particularly, it's interesting to uh, well, firstly, to to include uh, data and data publication uh, within the the broader framework of, of open science. So, open access publishing is 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 a, a mechanism by which we publish articles. But open science can be considered the broader framework in which we have uh, data publications, workflow tools, other data associated with the research that should be freely accessible. And then to, to your second point, um, which uh, is I see growing elsewhere globally is, is the evolution of uh, uh, summaries, plain language summaries, as they are sometimes called, that are uh, uh, expert summaries, but not within the specialism. So they are created to have a wider access point uh, and those should be published open access alongside the, the journal articles as well. Um, and I see those evolving within clinical medicine quite significantly. Um, so maybe if I come to uh, Professor Bo again and we ask from a clinician's point of view and an anesthesiologist's point of view, the, uh, the value of open science publications where we begin to include other data, we include maybe a, a short summary, a plain language summary, is that something that you're seeing or experience, experiencing in China amongst your colleagues in China? So you're still on mute. Need to un unmute, thank you. Okay, so uh, you. Martin, so you're not talking about the, the short summary or the, uh, the summary of the open access publications or what I can't, uh, follow you exactly yes. other questions 
so, so we're seeing more with open access uh, articles within specialisms that they are also additional uh, short summaries which are intended to communicate to a wider audience. So they may be to patients or they may be to funders. Um, and certainly from my perspective, I'm seeing more, uh, more use of those summaries within clinical medicine and clinical publications. Is that something that you've seen from your perspective? Uh, actually, I do read a lot of papers or reviews with the uh, summary or the short uh, summaries or their main ideas before we could uh, access the full text of the publications. Uh, well, uh, in my opinion, it is such as the advertisers, right? Before the, uh, before the main, 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 main course on the table. So maybe uh, the short summary is, is good or acceptable for the clinicians to get a very basic idea uh, of the manuscript or the publications, but we do need to read the full test of the of the uh, paper to to know the the research was performed, how the conclusion was get it from their data, and uh, so uh, for. At least for me, open access is a very good option to, to, to very quickly to obtain the, the publication. And uh, it could pro provide a lot of information for me. So uh, short summary or is good, acceptable, but we need to read the full text and open access is a good option for me at least. It's my uh, idea. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. And if I could just ask also about your experience with uh, uh, publication of data alongside articles. So within your experience, is that something that you're seeing more? Uh, well, sometimes we need more data or the supplementary uh, tables or figures or data from their original uh, groups. I think uh, if we need to do very uh, in-depth in analysis or the secondary analysis, that is very important for the clinicians. And because uh, more and more medical journals uh, publish uh, the articles just in several uh, pages, not in, the, not, in, uh, not in the full or long uh, test. So there's uh, more and more supplementary figures, tables or the videos online that could be downloaded from the from, from the uh, users. And however, as, as for me, uh, I don't think it is very uh, friendly for the users to download all of the, these kind of supplementary figures online. And uh, maybe there are some obstacles to, to stop the clinicians to areas online. I don't, I don't have the very good uh, options or idea to solve the problem. But uh, as I said first, we do need to read some supplementary materials if we want to, uh, to make uh, in-depth analysis of their data. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Bo. And maybe if I could come back to the li librarian's experience with, with data and data repositories and Dr. Adi Narayanan. Yeah. Do you have with with data repositories specifically and open data? What is the experience that you have and within your institution and also within India? Uh, as far as my experience, the research scholars they are prefer to publish, not prefer to publish in open access. They are thinking in the different way. It is not peer review. It is not quality or something like that. They themselves imagine. It. There are, of course, open access, peer reviewed, quality policy, everything is there, certain. But some of the scholars themselves, they thinking the open access means it is free of cost, no recognition, like that they themselves interpret and they are ready to prefer to publish in other normal payment journals. 
like leading publishers. So we have to change the, the scenario. We have to give the uh, webinar or training program, the publishers to come forward to conduct the training program for the scholars, new research scholars, newly entered in the uh, teaching teacher teaching professions. So they, we have to change their mindset first. Then only it will increase the uh, open access uh, publications will increase in India. This is my own experience. I met several scholars I suggested personally to go for open. No, no, open access means it is uh, not recognized by the government or institute like they, they themselves imagine. So the publisher should come forward to give demo or some training program or some some exercise we have to do it. This is my personal opinion. And it, 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 that's absolutely correct. More education around open access yeah. and the benefits of open access to, to scholars and researchers. You have to continue to do that. And uh, again, it's, it's not a problem that's distinct to, to India or Asia. It's you know, generally as well. Um, I do work in the United States and there's still barriers to US researchers publishing in open access because of that negative perception. Um, but things are changing. And uh, I think a lot of that change comes from the top down because ultimately that's what works. The government or the funding agencies then promoting or mandating open access. So again, do, in India, do you see the government moving forward clear enough to uh, mandate and promote open access? Uh, that is under the processing stage as far as my concern. Okay, thank you. And uh, Professor, Professor Jun Jun uh, also you know what? What are your what are your thoughts? We talked. You talked a little bit earlier about the you know, the quality misperceptions around open access. Um, but again, what more do you think publishers can be doing in the Asia region to continue to to help support the evolution of open access? I think that uh, one of the main um, issues that a lot of uh, of my colleagues have actually mentioned is the cost of open access. So that is one area where, you know, I think sometimes in certain cases, um, the funding that the researcher get is already not that high. And I think there, there are, of course, ways of uh, doing open access in a way that is affordable to researchers and, and, and scholars alike. And this is really, you know, uh, with, with the different kinds of uh, open access. I think the, the one that we are most familiar with is the goal open access uh, model, whereby the journals uh, will charge, uh, what do you call the article processing uh, yeah. charge or something, APC, and the author pays for the uh, document to be available publicly. But actually there is also, you know, uh, the green open access types where it actually allows for self-archiving. I thought this is actually very useful. Um, firstly, because well, ASTA, uh, where I'm part of, actually uh, allows us to self-archive our work through the green open access route. Um, in this case, you know, um, there, there's, there's almost zero cost. But of course, we are always told to check with the um, publisher policies before we start to upload all our articles up onto the portal. And I think that is actually a way um, to make our work publicly available. And also, uh, it is a little bit cheaper. Uh, the other aspect that I was also thinking about is the fact that um, you know a lot of open access journals now suffer from the double whammy of number one being a new journal and number two being uh, open access and having to pay pay yeah. APCs. Um, yeah. The question here is, uh, and, and of course, uh, I'm 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 starting out a new journal, so that that that's uh, something <laughs> which we'll go through uh, pretty soon as well. 
what is going to entice a scholar to publish the work with such journals? You know, these days, open access is not the, 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 the thing that attracts a scholar to publish, right? It is impact factor. And of course, this is, um, has to do with the perceived quality of a, a journal. I have disagreements about that, but I think by and large in Asia, we are focused on metrics, numbers, impact factor, and all that. Is there a way you know, that we can actually uh, think about how open access can actually enhance or bring value to the scholar in terms of maybe more citations, in terms of better recognition, in terms of um, visibility of the work. So these kind of benefits, if, if I may say, is actually something which is very important for us to communicate to the authors. And, and yeah. I think that's, that's probably the two key points I, 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 that comes to mind immediately. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Yeah, San, you, you, you... Uh, beautifully described the, the, the double farming challenge of launching a new journal because you need to uh, have ultimately an impact factor. You need to be indexed in Clarivate Analytics. You need to be generating, showing you can generate citations. Uh, to gain indexing, you need to have high quality uh, authors publishing to begin with. So it's a ca catch-22 situation. But there are enough studies done now independent evidence-based publishing studies to show that, for example, open access articles in certain disciplines get two or three times more citations, two or three times more downloads. So there are obvious citation benefits to open access. It may vary from discipline to discipline, but in most cases, there is a citation benefit. And that's something that a new journal should be communicating to, to authors. There is the barrier for new journals where if it doesn't have an impact factor, yet it's still charging an article processing charge. It's the anticipation then from the author is, well, you know, do I trust the publisher? Do I trust the editorial board for the journal, the editor in chief to achieve an impact factor? So I need to know as a researcher that the journal aspires to having an impact factor. And of course, for any new journal that launches, it doesn't the matter, matter if you're world scientific or nature or Lancet, if you launch a new journal, it will still be three, four, five years before you have your first impact factor. So the, the time between those first authors and then being able to communicate the citation and the impact factor for their work, it's a long time. So it, it's a, a, tr a trust issue between the, the author and the publication. Uh, publishers can do a lot to try and re reduce that uh, that barrier. Uh, it may be the case that for the first two or three years that uh, article processing charges are discounted or uh, uh, are, are removed completely to gain the citation benefit. It would be a strategic uh, option. But uh, launching new journals there are many, many new journals, open access journals being launched every year that are all very, ultimately very good, high quality journals, uh, lots of choices for authors, but then they all need to achieve um, an impact factor. That's still the driver for academic promotion and, and, and credit. So Rick, uh, Dr. Lee, can I ask you maybe just sort of thinking then about those, those like, launching new journals, because it's great to launch new journals in fields where there is a need, but then these barriers to open access, you know, the funding barriers, and then the, obviously the lack of an impact factor to begin with. Uh, how, how, how do publishers deal with this? How does World Scientific deal with this? I, I would think this is not a very simple um, solution to, 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 to tackle. I mean, it's not easy because any journal, when you first started, I mean, if you go back to the old time, it's a publisher's role to make sure in a subscription-based journal, the publisher make sure the journal is can be sustained <clears throat> and eventually become profitable. They will spend a lot and a lot of uh, effort and the beginning will invest a lot of uh, um, uh, resources 
to make it succeed. Okay, but open access changed the whole idea. Now, I'm not saying that open access, um, the mode it works it, is uh, very different. From publisher point, we, we, we will do the same thing. We will do the same thing. But the pressure on getting subscription is totally different. <clears throat> we don't have that kind of pressure anymore to get subscription. I mean, that is, I mean, it's an undeniable I mean, situation. But having said that, we also believe in open access. And what Sinjun mentioned, actually another mode of open access is free. And I'm sure in the American, <clears throat> they are more depend on the green open access. And actually we as a publisher, we also embrace green open access. We have, we make our rules are very easy to, uh, to, to uh, for, the, for the authors. So at the end of the day, I think we, we have to go back to our mission as a publisher is to promote science especially for world scientific is for the developing countries. So we try to make sure this kind of obstacle in terms of APC be affordable. And, and as I say, we even joined association to make it even waive the APC for some developing countries. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Having said that, nowadays publishing articles, the cost of publishing actually getting higher and higher. Uh, that is not, we cannot deny about it. And because of the, the way we publish, and now they, everyone uh, want immediate, when you publish an article, turnaround time has to be very fast, it's online right away, and then make sure it's getting indexed. Actually, a lot of costs involved from the publisher point of view. So there is no choice. We have to, to take that into consideration. Um, and, and I think another thing is, I'm, I'm also, I mean, personally, I'm, I cannot, at this part, I cannot uh, really represent the company per se, is I'm not so sure how the current mode of APC can be sustainable in the long run. Because actually a journal, it, it is still depending on the researcher whether they have the funding and enough funding for the APC. But I would imagine down the road, the open access model probably will go back to the diamond or, or the platinum mode of open access. That means these journals are being sponsored by organization or by, by a group of uh, 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 a consortium to support the open access. Now that way, then the diversity and the inclusion will not be an issue. Because now it seems that open access is still uh, based on APC and that means only those country or those individual who have enough support be able to do so. Um, we believe, I mean, open access is the, is the future, but from now till the future, I mean, the traditional publishing is still, will be still around and it will still be an important part of publishing. Just go back to just now, I mentioned about a number of points by Professor Pasit and also uh, Professor Paul. I think I, I, I get some interesting ideas from what they say. I mean, Professor Patsy talked about the um, writing a summary. I think actually I, I totally agree. Nowadays, if you look back to the COVID situation, if a lot of news, all this, and, and are very detailed, and sometimes detail, detail up to a point people don't understand. And now I start seeing people using a summary uh, infograph type of way of presenting. That is very useful. And, and that may help to promote science. And doesn't matter if it's open access or not. And I think that is one way from a publisher point of view, we should think about it. And to promote science then, and at the same time, if the information is so critical, time dependent, I think we should find ways to make it accessible as soon as possible. Uh, especially the, the, the issues that related to uh, uh, the common good of humankind. And Professor Bao mentioned about the data. And in fact, just a few days ago, uh, I also attend an open access uh, webinar in Singapore. It's by the Cora, it's more for the librarians. And actually, I, we learn a lot. I, I learn a lot. And, and now I'm thinking about, even thinking about maybe one day, well, scientific should have some repository for the data, open access data, not just the publication. So maybe this is something down the road that we are. As a publisher, as I say, we need to promote science we need to, to disseminate knowledge and we should be more open mind on all these kind of opportunities. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And uh, it, it comes to, we, we're 
talking about alternative models there, and you talked about uh, diamond open access as an example of an alternative model to take the burden away from individual uh, authors paying article processing charges, which we know is, is, is a challenge. So to have a, a sponsor or a, a funder to underwrite the costs for those authors is highly attractive. So uh, we have one question from uh, our audience, which is very to the point, which is about subscribe to open, which is a form of uh, a transformative uh, deal. So amongst publishers now, a big discussion point and a big evolution around the open access business model is to transition away the burden on individual authors to uh, the library or government institution and also to address the, uh, the long-standing challenge with uh, open access uh, and subscription-based revenues being linked together and how to ultimately transition to a open access business model and to convert subscription-based journals to open access. So uh, many uh, in the audience today will have heard of Plan S or Coalition S, which is a grouping of 32 funders within Europe that are pushing very successfully large publishers like Springer Nature and Elsevier and Wiley to look at converting their subscription-based journals to open access and designing uh, business models uh, falling under the term transformative agreements to allow that transformation to happen gradually over a number of years. So this is very interesting. This is happening now. This means that uh, in four or five years time, a very significant number of subscription-based journals that are currently behind firewalls will be freely accessible and that the cost will be underwritten by governments, funders, not individual authors. Mm. So it'll be free for authors to publish and it'll be free for readers to publish. So that, that is a great advancement, but the transformation is happening right now. Uh, Dr. Lee, maybe, is, could you talk a little bit more about the transformative agreement and, and how that is playing out within Asia? Yes, actually, um, and end of last month, we were invited uh, by the planners um, to join a webinar together with a few international big publishers to talk about transformative agreements. Um, so far, um, it's still a little bit complicated, but the idea is correct. Idea, that means what uh, Martin mentioned is, Eventually, the journal now is behind paywall, they will become open. And in fact, at some point, we also already participated uh, a few journals into this transformative agreement. But at the same time, we also got, uh, uh, have um, working with an institution on this read and publish. That means what, whatever the institution pay, and then the pay, whatever the subscription they pay, actually is not a subscription, it's actually is for the publishing cost. That means whoever, what, uh, all the publication from this institution will become open access directly without paying extra. And in fact, actually they will, we, in, from our point of view, actually we will invite more people, more researcher from that institution to publish with us without paying extra. Um, but having said that, during that uh, webinar, just end of last uh, month, and they still have a lot of uh, challenges because in order to do that, this is uh, transformative, the plan as transformative agreement, they do have some requirements to fulfill. Um, a lot of information need to be gathered. And then that part, I think they haven't settled. Uh, um, they are still working on it. Actually, plan is still working on it. And they even mentioned at some point, uh, what if some journal now is already in the transformative uh, agreement route? What if they cannot make this, the, the requirement? They have certain requirement. That means at certain stage, you have to reach a certain number of open access in the journal. If you cannot reach it, what will happen? Uh, this is still outstanding. But with so many publishers on board and everyone really believe in it, I'm sure this kind of issue will be settled very soon. Yeah, but in the meantime, I think um, we are trying to have more of our journal into a transformative route. And at the same time, I think read and publish is actually um, for institution by institution is a, a much simpler way compared to transformative uh, in order to make it work. Yeah. 
could I maybe ask uh, Professor Bo around funding for open access in China? So uh, for a, a individual researcher, how easy is it or not to get funding to publish open access? Um, well, it depends uh, because all of the individual researchers can have a lot of methods to uh, gain the funding from the national or the or other sources of fundings. Uh, but uh, year by year, it is uh, much more difficult for researchers to get that because the uh, all of the application, the grant applications quality has been improved. And a lot of researchers had very good papers or publications year by year. So, and another question is a lot, lot of the more uh, young researchers are emerging and to pour into the academic community. So, with the funding, uh, in total is limited and the application is increased very significantly. And uh, just as, take me for an example, if I apply a grant from the uh, National Natural Science Foundation and the, the success rate is as low as uh, 12% for me, to get a fund. So, uh, but, if, but if you get a fund successfully, you will be granted for another four or five years to have your research uh, go very smoothly. And uh, in China, uh, the funds can cover some of the journals, even it is open access but uh, the policies has been strengthened uh, year by year because there's a lot of uh, open access uh, journals which are not in high quality, uh, such as, such as uh, the, with very low impact factors or with a very high percentage of submission from China. And thus every institution has their own uh, policies to to guide the to guide the funding use. Uh, if you uh, submit a submit a, a article in an open access journal with a very low quality, the fund will not uh, will not uh, help you to publish in these kind of journals. So you can't get uh, the fund from 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 it. That, that's all. Thanks, Martin. And, and so, so impact factor is still important. It's a bit uh, it's actually a big factor. It is not so important currently because uh, um, we have a lot of methods to evaluate the quality of the submission or the articles, mm -hmm. and all of the institution in China has other methods to evaluate whether you are uh, qualified or not. So impact for us is important, but it's not so important now. We, we just uh, took a look at the impact factor, but we also to evaluate yourself by other methods, whether you have uh, you are qualified for the operation, you have other kind of, uh, kind of contribution to your field, not just the, not just the publications. Thank you. Thank you. And, um... So I'm just looking to some questions from, from the audience. And um, we've talked about the, the new business model, the uh, transformative model, which is, is linked to the subscribe to open model. We have talked about negative perceptions and countering negative perceptions to open access, which is a, another question. Um, so, Maybe if I come back to uh, uh, Singapore and the issue again of fu funding, uh, Professor Jiang Jun, um, 
do you feel that the from everything that we've discussed here in an alternative business models for open access uh, and there seems to be a, a move forward to to alleviate that burden on individual authors um, uh, do you see that being successful well uh, that's a very very interesting question um, because I think in my in my other role I also uh, serve as uh, the, the president of the Singapore National Institute of Chemistry. So this is the, the National uh, Chemical Society uh, in Singapore. And I think that the way of aggregating the cost for open access, either via um, the societies, via organizations, or via uh, uh, an alliance of sorts, it's actually a very useful idea to allow for the dissemination of work, good quality work through open access, such that it does not disadvantage the people who do not actually have any funds to do this. I, I personally feel, right, um, and, and this is my own opinion, is that I don't think good science should be uh, limited by uh, the lack of funding, uh, the dissemination of good science right, should, should not be limited by that. In fact, if we think back about the premise of open access, it is actually to allow the work to be publicly available, to be free for people to read and uh, absorb the knowledge. So that should not actually be uh, something that holds back a researcher from publishing his or her best work. Um, the, the, the other thing that I, I maybe I also sometimes like to also think from the perspective of publishers as well, right? Um, there are costs, there are costs in not, right? The, the management of the journal, the management of the uh, um, uh, uh, websites, all these things, you know, these involve costs and let's, let's be probably a bit fair to the publishers. They are not charities. And it is impossible to expect that uh, there's zero uh, cost open access APCs. I think that's not going to happen anytime soon. I think. Um, and so what is the sweet spot that we have to hit? Balancing the needs of the journals as well as the uh, publishers. What is the sweet spot? You know, some are, sometimes you know, we think it's too expensive and for the funding side, it is also too expensive and, and everybody gets stuck in a limbo that way. So I think it's very important for us to, to, to find uh, an agreement point. Yeah. And I think that's a, a wonderful point to, to, to find that sweet spot as you described, which is to move away from the discussion around cost, obviously cost is a burden, but to have uh, a discussion around value and the, the value of a publication uh, for which there is a cost and ultimately a price that uh, an author, a funder, a government is willing to pay to achieve that value-based proposition. So um, I, I'm much more encouraging about discussions on, on value related to open access publishing and open science for which there is a cost. But to focus solely on the cost means that we, we don't consider the value um, and adding value. And that's the challenge for publishers is then to add value to publications, to look at innovation, technology innovation around a traditional journal article, to add the ability to embed that article with metadata, persistent identifiers, for example, the ORCID ID or the, the DOI or uh, credit or other metadata and identifiers that will help uh, greater disseminate that knowledge. Uh, and so that's where I think the communication and the education comes back. And if I come back to uh, Dr. Adi Naran in, the, in, in India, you mentioned education and educating scholars and researchers. I, there's so much more that needs to be done. And I think publishers have a, a duty and an ability to share that knowledge and insight into the values and to help 
you within your institution and for your research is to then to gain confidence around open access publishing and to, to, to not discount the, the cost discussion because that is a challenge, but to really focus on, on, on the value. So I'm wondering for, for you again in, in India, are there particular areas within open access publishing where publishers can help educate, um, add that value and help you support the advancement of open science in India? Yeah, are you audible? I can hear you, yes. I'm just wondering from, from an Indian perspective, what uh, you, we talked about education right at the very beginning. Are there particular areas within open access publishing where publishers can help you? Okay. Uh, as far as uh, open access movement in India, research scholars per view, that social science, they have more importance rather than the engineering and technology. Because the uh, scientists, scholars, they are much prefer the so social science subjects instead of rather than the engineering and technology. And uh, so within open access, uh, social science and humanities have a yes. challenge because there is a particular yes, yes. lack of funding. Whereas, yes, yes as you say, the, the hard sciences, the material sciences and the clinical sciences as well have access to much more significant funds. Um, and within social sciences, humanity, if we could sort of explore that from an Indian perspective, mon monographs are more prevalent in terms of publication than journals. So what, what is the experience with open access and monographs in uh, India? That experience, as far as uh, my cancer, I didn't get any uh, point from my personal land, uh, openly speaking, for this uh, scenario, this, this contest. Thank you. Um, if I can come back to Dr. Lee and, and just thinking about any uh, as, as we begin to think about wrap, wrapping up our, our very, very good discussion, thank you. Uh, do you have any other thoughts, Dr. Lee? I think um, I, I really thank uh, today's panelists. I mean, they, they come up with a lot of interesting idea and then they really share with us what's happening in different uh, uh, setting, different country and uh, yeah, different subject areas. But I, I, I do think that yeah, open access in Asia is still a bit slow and is falling behind to the to the to the Western world, the global north. Um, it's important we understand, but I think whatever we talk about, we shouldn't get away what, what are we supposed to achieve is it, the disseminate of knowledge. And that is the ultimate point that we want to do. Um, I, I I do understand yeah the APC route is actually is very complicated. Um, from publisher point of view, actually, we, we, we are trying to stay away the, the whole time and people talk about double D, the problem, especially for subscription-based journal, those hybrid journal, they will give the impression this double D. And we make our, uh, uh, our so-called APC very um, uh, e easier to, for, actually it's based on the need. We, okay, I, I can, Maybe I, I share by, by examples. Um, we have quite a number of cases for some of our journals, they're subscription-based journal. We do, we do allow uh, open access, but of course we have a so-called standard rate, but we always, this so-called standard rate is actually, is the, like you buy something, it's like a list price and all these price are negotiable and really based on the need. Uh, we have a number of cases we waive uh, the open access because of certain situation uh, or because, um, the, the person want to have open access published as soon as possible for, for certain needs. And we really lower the price up to a point, I think it's very affordable. And for, for those cases, actually, we are not talking about, I mean, earning any money. I mean, it, it's just make sure we satisfy author's needs. But having said that, I also need to, um, we also need to educate user other than the so-called go open access, there's still a, still a green route. And a lot of times I think that the understanding of green open access is actually people are 
starting to not talk too much about it anymore at some point. But uh, I, I, I do feel that this is uh, for dissemination of information and that is another what that people should understand. And, and the Asian country, especially um, just now we talk about, um, I'm not so sure a lot of people in the Asian context, they understand the green open access as much as, as they should be. So I think as a publisher, we need to educate uh, all, all the, uh, our, our stakeholder, including the authors uh, or, or at the tall board members and so on. There are different ways of disseminating, uh, to disseminate information, not just the goal open access. And of course, as a publishing house, we, we have to make sure our, the quality is always there. And this is our still number one uh, uh, priority and open access is is just a, a business model and more for uh, faster to disseminate information. I, I think yeah, mm -hmm. I, I I really appreciate uh, everyone today here to join us for this discussion. Uh, because Pose uh, Professor Pasit had something really urgent; he need to leave. Actually, he left us um, just a few minutes ago. And I, I, I don't know, any, any of our uh, panelists, any, any things want to add on? Uh, uh, Professor Bao, do you have anything want to add on? Uh, no, thanks. Um, uh, Sing Jun? Uh, thank you. I think it's a very fruitful uh, sharing session. Uh, Professor Ake. Hariya. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. yeah. yeah. Uh, very fruitful information. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Martin, maybe. And, well, I'm, I'm so glad that we, we've, we've covered a lot and uh, we did anticipate that we would need a, a full 90 minutes to have a good conversation. But we've had some very, very good perspectives, a funding perspective, a clinical researcher, a librarian. Thank you. And uh, from uh, Singapore and also from uh, a journal editors' point of view, because uh, that that's that's very helpful, and from the from the publishers. So we know that open access in Asia is developing quickly, probably not as quickly as uh, many would like. Um, we can learn a lot uh, in Asia from what's happening elsewhere in the world, um, but we certainly have the technologies and the capabilities to advanced science and as Dr. Lee say, ultimately that's the, the goal is to, to better advance science through open sharing of information, data, knowledge and reducing those barriers in, in equity to access that, that information. So thank you all very much for a really fruitful discussion. Um, I hope that perhaps individually we can take these discussions forward. Thank you to our audience, uh, we hope that we've had the chance to cover uh, many of the topics that have been raised through the discussion threads we, we have actually covered. Um, but we thank you again for this opportunity. This is the, the end of the open access week. So I wish you all a, a happy Friday and a happy weekend. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye.